in the satsang and I'm especially pleased because I want to speak about a subject which I haven't spoken about for a long time and um, which is um, which impresses me, which touches me because it uh, touches some aspects of the heart chakra. I would like to give you a few readings of stories, exemplary stories, from a brand of the Fathers of the Desert, a chapter which is lesser known. And um, they come obviously from the Christian mysticism, these ones. And uh, in yoga, we try to understand all the forms of mysticism, Jewish or Kabbalistic, Christian, Gnostic or not, Islamic, Sufi or not, as well as elements of Hinduism and Buddhism. Strictly speaking, yoga is born in the Hindu religion and it has expanded easily into the Buddhist religion. So there is a Hindu yoga, a Buddhist yoga, and there is, of course, here and there some Jainistic yoga, some Sikhistic yoga, and others, but most of them due to the regional uh, interpretation uh, of the things in India. There are even books published on so-called Taoist yoga, like Chinese versions on yoga, and therefore yoga is multicultural in the meaning that it crosses the boundaries of religions. It's an esoteric science about the mind, the body, the soul, the chakras, the resonance. And uh, therefore, with yoga, we try to understand a lot of useful things. When we want to understand many things from Anahata chakra, of course, we, we find bhakti yoga and a lot of heart chakra in India, but we also find it in the Western mysticism and especially in the Christian mysticism. And thus, uh, my uh, purpose is not just to quote different stories from you, which will touch you. Some of them will be very, very touching in terms of Anahata and its qualities. If you want to pass, pass, but pass quickly. So you, you can go. It's not a forbidden thing to pass in front of the guy. This being said, um, the purpose is to give you an understanding of Anahata Chakra because often you will see that um, a Christian Anahata from the Middle East and the Indian Anahata from India, they are different. And the Tibetan Anahata of the, with Tibetan style, they are also different. Not to mention that according to the dominant chakras, people in spirituality, they don't always go by the principle of Anahata Chakra. Most of the people in Agama, having some roots in the European and Western culture in general, they are conditioned. The values which you learn in school, in society, in television, even when people proclaim that they are atheistic or agnostic or whatever, still uh, 2,000 years of Christianity have left a subconscious imprint that people cannot get rid of. And you see this Christian background in the Hollywood movies, in the whatever uh, kind of form of um, Western culture, religious or not. And that's why uh, many of these values, especially the extreme ones coming from the fathers of the desert, as they are called, uh, they are very touching. People are very touched by it. It's very difficult in the West to conceive spirituality without Anahata Chakra. If you would be born in Japan and raised in Japan, there the Zen Buddhist environment, the Shinto environment and others, they contain very little Anahata and the culture is based, is based to a large extent on Manipura Chakra. There are, of course, uh, sexual, sensual connotations on Zvadhisthana, but they are always kept as secondary as well. And as such, if you would live in Zen monasteries and with Zen mystics, and if you would live about the lives of Zen patriarchs and their teachings, you would have to see human typologies 
which are very much on Manipura, of course with extensions on Ajna, Sahasrara, that means it's not just Manipura, but it starts from Manipura, it's based on Manipura. In a similar way, this early Christian mysticism is based on Anahata to a large extent. The Christian mysticism in the Middle East is mixed with a lot of fire, even in the attitude of Jesus, you see a lot of Manipura, he is not at all a soft Anahata, he is a burning Anahata, an Anahata with fire, and uh, you see the same thing in the temperament of these people that are quoted in today's lecture. For me, it is important more to inspire you in terms of inspiration, and I will say a few words about that in a second, and it is also very important to explain some moral, ethical, psychological, and pragmatical values, practical values. How did they practice spirituality? What was their attitude? Especially from the standpoint of yoga and of the chakras and understanding how were those people educated? What was their background? What was their emotion on Anahata and all the rest? I spoke about aspiration. The fathers of the desert, there were also some women among them, so the name fathers of the desert is not very politically correct. We should say the fathers and the mothers of the desert, but we are not doing a political correctness course here. Uh, the so-called fathers of the desert, who flourished between the 4th century and uh, the 8th, 9th, 10th century, Many stories are prior to the Prophet Muhammad's advent, and some stories are after the Islamic culture was started in the same parts of the world. Uh, these people had very little technology. Most of their technology was to stand up like in Tadasana and pray to God. That was one of the standard practices. But standing up in Tadasana, it meant like standing up minimum two hours. Like if anybody complains, uh, and it happens all day long, so it's more of a joke, this one, that Tadasana is difficult to do five minutes, then you will hear some stories about some fathers of the desert who stayed in prayer for seven hours or eight hours non-stop with their arms up. And therefore, uh, you will see that Tadasana is difficult only when you are not in the proper state of mind. When you are in the proper state of mind, you forget about your body, and Tadasana becomes almost like body language. It becomes like an expression of your inner thing. So, these fathers of the desert, they didn't have much technology. That means the prayer of the heart, although allegedly it ran through the Christian culture for centuries, it became established fully, like put on paper, only in the 15th century. These people are a thousand years before that. So the prayer of the heart, there was nothing written about it, except that the formula appears to have been known. But the technology that you sit in Vajrasana and you put two fingers on your chest and you breathe in and then you do that and then you visualize that and then you whatever, all this technology did not exist. So these people prayed to God without having a clear technology. They prayed to God only with their hearts, only with their soul. The only thing which they had abundantly was aspiration. These people, even without a method, they were ready to break through heaven. Yoga, for example, is quite the opposite. When you read the Garanda Samhita or Shiva Samhita or Hatha Yoga Pradipika, there there is an ocean of technology. You don't know what to do, you just stand up and do 30 Udhyana Bandhas and talk to me again after 30 Udhyana Bandhas, you know. It's like you have some things which work mechanically, almost. These people, they didn't know much technology, like what to do. How would you pray better to Jesus? And all they had was an incredible aspiration. That's why I have noticed on myself and every time when I shared with other people that just the mention of a few of these stories and a few of these teachings is increasing people's aspiration, especially in the heart chakra. 
like a longing, a determination to really follow the spiritual path in spite of so many difficulties which it can bring. And, as I said, it's this typology of Anahata Chakra. Maybe some of you will like it, many some of you will like it but will realize you don't have it too much. Maybe some of you will say, well, it's not my baby, this is not how my parents or how my teachers or how my religion or how my is, then the way I practice religion or it's a different in a different way. Even then, it is beautiful to be informed about the, some of these typologies. I said it's a rare thing. There is a, there is a famous book called the Patericon, the lives of the fathers of the desert, and that's usually taken as uh, standard. If you Google and go on Wikipedia or an informative encyclopedic place like that and you Google or search Fathers of the Desert, then you will find references most definitely to this Patericon. These so-called Fathers of the Desert, they were actually spread in three different areas, close to neighboring each other, but still three different areas. One of it was south of Cairo, south of Alexandria and Cairo in the Egyptian desert. These were the first communities in places like Kelia and Nitria and others, places which today still are connected somehow with a Coptic church, Coptic Egyptian church, and uh, they still exist. Places in the peninsula of Sinai, which theoretically belongs to Egypt, technically it belongs to Egypt, but it is under some sort of supervision or administration from the state of Israel, because in the 1960s, when they had war with Egypt and the Arab countries, then Israel took a sort of safety zone to make sure that they are not coming again, and therefore there are Israeli soldiers patrolling in Sinai, but technically it's still part of Egypt on the maps. And then in the desert, which today belongs shared to Israel and Palestine, whichever is whichever, because those people don't find peace to draw some clear border lines and to say, this is ours, this is yours, and so on. And they keep on pushing on top of each other. In those areas around Jerusalem, in the desert, around Jerusalem and south from it, there are areas which like the St. Sava Monastery, the St. George of Joseva and others, there are monasteries lost in that desert, which have a history that 15 centuries ago, 16 centuries ago, there were there the so-called fathers of the desert, the great early Christian mystics. Out of those, the ones which are least known are the ones from the peninsula of Sinai, of Sinai, and um, I got to know about them through a book translated from Greek, which was translated into Romanian. I have never been able to find this book in English. Maybe it's never been translated. And because of that, I am going to have some difficulties in translating directly with uh, to you. It is uh, a Greek guy called Dimitris Tsamis who took the chronicles from the different patericons, which are very popular in Greece, and he spoke about the elders of Sinai. And um, because they are lesser known, because you can buy yourself a book easily about the fathers of the desert from Egypt or something, but these ones, are uh, some of them are amazing as well, and it's a pity that the world knows so little about them. So I took some, a list of stories. Most of them are short stories. And I took them because some of them either have amazing teachings and some of them have the reports about amazing lives. And in all of them, I'm trying to see, most of all, the opening of the heart chakra and also the relationship with the universal consciousness. How did? Of course, we don't expect that these people are doing things of yoga, although you will find here and there practices which are related directly with the self-awareness and other such practices.
And here is a little story. Again, the, my reading will be clumsy and slow because I'm translating directly from Romanian. I don't have any English translation of this. If I were to prepare just for this, I would have to work 15 days to just translate, translate, translate each and every paragraph. And I have never done that. But I'm sure you'll get something. I have, if I look here, probably 20 to 30 different stories. Most of them are just a paragraph long. They are short. So we'll go slowly through them to see what can we get for a yogi, for somebody who has aspiration and does yoga, and especially for the development of the heart chakra, what do we get? A very industrious or devoted brother came from a wild away place, these are anonymous saints, some of them, and stayed in a little hut in, on the Mount Sinai. So this was just around the Mount Sinai, the mountain where Moses, in the old days, met with God, was said to have met with God, and God gave him the tablets of the law. And in the first day, as soon as he came to settle down here, he found a little piece of wood which had engraved on it by the brother who lived in that hut before him, and it was written like this, Me, Moses, son of Theodore, I am here present and I witness. Which is again a bit of Ramana Maharishi kind of thing. And this brother, this new brother, he was, we don't even know his name, was putting this piece of wood every day in front of his eyes and he was asking as if the man who wrote this piece of wood was still there. And he said, where are you, O man, who say here on this piece of wood, that I am present here and I am witnessing. In which world would you be in this moment? Where is the hand who wrote these things? And like this, doing this every day and remembering about death, he was insisting, crying. Important little word there, yeah? Crying. And he had as karma yoga, as we'd say, as duty, calligraphy. The fathers in the monastery said, you live in our monastery, here is something which we ask you to please copy. Because in those days there was no printed and people were handwriting books. So they gave him a chapter, something, you know, do something. And taking from the brothers paper and the commandment to write, he died... We don't need him, we are not told after how long time. He died without ever writing anything for anybody. Only he, they found a little note in his hut on which it was written after leaving the papers back to each one of them, exactly as he took them, but not doing any karma yoga. He said, please forgive me, my lords and my brothers, because I had a little thing to solve with someone and that's why I didn't find time to write for you. No? Try to imagine a daily life in which you do nothing. You cannot say you didn't have time. This guy didn't have an eight-hour job or something. And he just found a pretext which was triggering his aspiration, a piece of engraved wood from a predecessor, and he said, you say that you are here present and you witness, but where are you actually? And then this brought to him the thought of the Tibetans would say of impermanence. See, somebody was here and he said, I'm present and I'm witnessing. But he's not. Where is he? Is he dead? Did he move somewhere? If he's dead, is he in paradise or in hell? Or where did he go? Was he good? And he was insisting crying. One of the gifts of prayer is called the gift of tears, and that is a very big gift. If when you pray, you cry, that's a privileged way. You can pass in front of the camera, don't worry. Don't worry. And the second thing is he had a karma yoga. You would say, well, I mean, they gave him a house to live. <laughs> and they said, at least do some calligraphic copying. And he did the zilch. Either he was there three years or five years or 30 years, we are not being told. He did nothing. 
He just gave the papers back as they were. And he said in a very modest way, sorry, I had a small thing to share with someone, that someone was Jesus, obviously, you know, or the man who was there before, because he was meditating on his words. And so I did not find time to write to you. There is a beautiful conference by Osho Rajneesh in which he says most modern people live with a sense of utilitarianism, that they always think that they have to be good for something or else they have to be thrown to the garbage. But he said your value is just in the fact that you are. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to make yourself useful. This utilitarian thing, which is more like in astrology the verb of the Capricorn, that I utilize to be, you know, spend your time on earth usefully. This man did nothing. And he is praised as having done great things. And we spoke about Ramana Maharishi like practices. Here is one of them. An old man who was sitting in Rait, Rait one was one of the communities. There were small monasteries and communities in which people were like really far from each other. They were not uh, socializing or doing extremely little, only when they were meeting on Christmas and on Easter for the service. Uh, no, but otherwise, they were alone. But the areas were still there, Kelia, Nitria, Rait, and so on, St. Sava. And so. An old man, an elder who was living in Rait, he had this work, sitting always in his hut, thoughtful, with his gaze towards the earth and shaking all the time his head, he was saying with a sigh, with a sigh, like on the verge of crying. Yeah? He was saying, I wonder what's happening to me. And again, being silent for one hour and working at kneading, he was doing baskets. They had straw. And they were making baskets and then one of them once a month was going and selling the baskets and buying wheat or something which they were eating. And working manually, he was again shaking his head after one hour and saying, I wonder what's happening to me. And like this, he spent all the days of his life always taking care of his exit from this life. Like it wants to say all his life was a preparation for death. He lived so he could die properly. This is, would you invest your life to be able to die properly? Is this useful enough? Ramakrishna said, most Western people are so possessed by this industriousness that their spirit becomes rajasic and all the time they want to do, do, do. You have something to do. You are busy. You have something to do. There is nothing to be done from the standpoint of this kind of people. Now, another one. It's a story. See how mystical people saw these things. As one of the fathers and his disciple, they climbed on Mount Sinai. You can still climb on Mount Sinai from the monastery of St. Catherine, which is in the valley there. <clears throat> Around 10 years ago, for this manuscript, because these are scrolls from the 6th century, 7th century, two of the fathers from the holy mountain of Sinai, out of which one is still in his body, so it was, he was alive at the time of writing this, they went to make some penance, some worship, in, on the holy mountain. On the holy mountain there is a small chapel, a small altar. Reaching about the distance of two arrows, like throwing an arrow, I don't know how to, 500 meters, would it be two arrow lengths, two arrow shots from the monastery of St. Elijah, they felt an, an extremely beautiful smell, which was different from all the beautiful smells of this world, like an unreal perfume was in the air like incense or something. So the apprentice, the younger one, thought that the man who was taking care of that monastery made, spread incense for the morning. And he tell, and the elder, 
who was also his elder and who is still alive, told to him, this is not an earthly good smell. Coming even closer to the church, there they see inside like it was like an oven with fire inside the church. It's not a real church. It's like a small chapel. And the fire was like blades of fire coming out through all the windows and the doors. Seeing this, the apprentice became afraid of this, but the elder encouraged him, tell, tell, taking him, What are you afraid, son? These are angelic powers which are together with us serving God. And we do, and he says, Do not be afraid of them because they bow down to our nature in heaven. We do not bow down to their nature. Remember, this elder said, the angels worship you because you have the Shiva consciousness, you have Atman. Yeah? You do not worship them. You don't worship the angels. The angels are asked by God to serve you and they worship you. Yeah? Of course, you have to be deserving their worship. Therefore, entering without any fear in the church, like they would have entered into an oven, they prayed and they went to the holy top, being already spring. Because it's extremely hot, it's in the desert, people climb from 3 o'clock in the morning and about 6 o'clock they're up on the mountain and they catch the sunrise. When the monk who was in charge of that church saw them, <clears throat> when coming out, their faces were shining and luminous, exactly like the face of Moses when he came down the mountain. And he told them, what did you see when you were climbing up? And they, wanting to hide the fact, they said, nothing, nothing. And then he told them, believe me, you did see something, because look, your faces are shining in glory in the glory of the Holy Spirit. So, bowing down to his feet and telling him the story, they ask him to please not tell anybody else about this story. Yeah. So, the beautiful teachings about angels, how angels have this power from God, but actually they are meant to serve, that they worship the divine nature. What's the divine nature? Purusha, Atman, the Supreme Self. That's why the human being is privileged on this planet. Of course, they are shitting on this privilege and they are destroying their own lives and polluting them. But actually, these great mystics, the father here, the elder, it, they revealed that, you know, it's like angels are serving the human beings. You should have courage with this. And the beautiful second part, that they had some divine states, and when they came back, and the other guy, the third guy, could see, they in the beginning did not want to say it. Exactly like the yogis are being told, don't speak about your experiences. When you get something spiritual, talk to your guru, but for the rest, don't speak about it. They lied blatantly, you know, by the way of telling lies. You know, they simply said, no, nothing, nothing, you know, just to protect because otherwise people will say, oh, you've seen the fire of God, you've seen angels, oh my God, you are so blessed, you know. They refused so that their ego should not be praised in any way, you know, and the, this guy was experienced, you know, and probably he himself had seen plenty of things up there. No, I told them, come on, don't bullshit me because it can be seen on your faces. You, know, you are shining like you have sunshine inside you, you know. And they said, okay. They bent down to his feet. They touched his feet like he was a guru. And they told him the story, but they asked him not to tell to anybody. The story is known. But who these people were, we don't know. Their modesty is still being protected by the time. Another wild story 
in the valley of Sida, there was a holy man who had with him one apprentice. One day, sending this apprentice to Raith, so it's the same area which was mentioned. Again, I don't know the geography of Sinai too well. I don't know if Raith is south of Catherine or east of Catherine. Or... But I know that at the bottom of Mount Sinai, there is a very important monastery called St. Catherine in the name of St. Catherine the Great, an amazing female saint. And um, he sent this young boy to Raith, and after three days, being the old man in the desert which, with which, through which he was coming back, and being very deep in contemplation, in divine contemplation, he saw the apprentice coming from far, far away. He had his mind telescope. And thinking that maybe it was a Sarazin, Sarazin means the Bedouins and perhaps the early Islamic soldiers, so already there would be somebody who puts your life in danger for him. Then he turned himself into a date tree. The old man turned himself into a date tree, says the story. Yeah? Wanting to stay hidden. Therefore, his apprentice reaching in that place touched the, hit the date tree with his palm, and he said, when did this date tree grow here? Because that was near their hut. And he knew that there was no date tree there. And he said, when did this date tree had time to grow here? Being taken by God's hand, the old man reached before him to the cave, and so the cave was like one day away, you know, and Greeting him the second day in the morning, he told him with love, Why did you hit me, brother? Yesterday you slapped me. You know? But the apprentice threw himself at the feet of the old man, denying, because he didn't know that he would have done this thing. Then the old man told him the story with the date tree, because it was that it was him and that because at that time he was in a divine state of consciousness, and because he did not want to be separated by this state of consciousness from a human cause, then he changed having the aspect of a tree. Yeah. So basically he said, I was in Samadhi, I had to spend some more time, then I didn't want that you coming would spoil, no? I turned, God made me into a tree. Is it possible? It stretches anybody's faith. Is it possible that like how far he was? And then after the disciple went, this guy flew like the wind and was in the cave before him. So this old man could dematerialize, materialize, beam me up Scotty and turn into a fig tree or whatever that was into a palm date or something. Are these real people? And they had no technology. Remember, they didn't use mantras and yantras or anything. It was all the effect of prayer taken to incredible lengths. As another wonderful story which teaches us something. Once in Raith, the same place, a rich man from a foreign country came and he made love to the brothers with gold coins. It's an expression which they used to make love. To make love means to give food to somebody, to give a donation. To eat. For them, that means to make love. From where even making love is, you know, how do you make love when you have sex? No, it's about making love. It's an expression which comes from the early Christian mystics. This guy made love to the brothers with gold coins. And he sent also one of them to a hermit, who was sitting there into a hut. So he didn't see, he just sent, said, give to that brother a coin as well. And in that night, the elder, this old man, he sees a field which is full of thorns, like this desert, plants which have thorns, you know, like full of thorns, thorny plants. And somebody told him, come and cut away, come in the field and cut away the love of those who gave you the gold coin. In the morning, the hermit, they 
he sent somebody to bring to him this lover of Christ who gave him the coin and gave him back the gold, telling him, please take your gold, ho gold coin back, brother, because I cannot crop thorns of other people. I would be very happy if I could crop at least mine. So remember, when somebody gives you a gold coin, the deal is you have to pray for them. You have to solve their problems. There is no free lunch. Aparigraha, do not accept gifts unless you are ready to take what comes with the gift. Yeah? This guy was, from his heart, giving a coin. But together with it, there was the field of thorns from his mind. And the old man said, I would be happy if I could sort out my own. I would prefer not to take the coin, so I don't have the responsibility for yours. Or maybe other brothers took it. They didn't realize. But this old man being so clairvoyant, so sensitive, he saw it and he had scruples about it. An elder man, we are still in the stories of the Anonymous. For some of them we know their names, but these ones which I have first here, they are Anonymous. They are the ones we don't even know. So he says, a certain old man, we don't know his name, came to Mount Sinai, and as soon as he came out of here, he met on the road a brother who was complaining and telling to the old man, we are in trouble, father, because it's not raining. As a drought. And the old man says, but why don't you pray and ask for God to come? And the brother said, we are making prayers, we are making services, and still it's not raining. Then the old man told him, it is surely that you do not pray with intensity. Do you want to see that this is how it is? Let us sit together and pray. And then he stretched his hands, his arms towards heaven, and he prayed. And in, in that moment, rain started falling. Immediately, rain started falling. And seeing this, the brother became afraid. And falling on his knees, he bowed down to the old man. And the old man immediately ran away from there. Like, we don't know who he was. He didn't want, it was not about him. He did this so that the other man can have more faith, not that he should be praised. And therefore, in the moment when things got to, oh my goodness, your prayer is like, okay, you didn't understand. I wanted to show you that at a certain degree of prayer, things are just happening. It's as simple as that. No? Even rain in the desert. Sinai is a piece of desert. Maybe it rains five times per year in that place. This old man sat down to pray, and then it started raining quickly. Quickly. Not after two days of prayer. Quickly. Maybe it was half an hour or something, but still quickly. So this is... I wrote some... Some of these stories are really long and wild and so on. One of the brothers came to an old man who was living in Mount Sinai and he asked him, saying, Father, tell me how should I pray? Because many times I have angered God. They had a great feeling of guilt, you know, because their prayer was not good enough. And then they were feeling like God gets angry at them which many psychologists would say, oh, you shouldn't have a sense of guilt and so on. These people were navigating through it very well. They were not doing human psychology. They were doing theological psychology, to which the old man told him, son, when I pray, I say like this, O oh Lord, make me capable to serve you as well as I have served the devil before serving you now. And make me worthy to love you as much as I loved my sins before knowing you. No? Like he said, you know, when I was doing things for the world and for the devil, 
I was very eager and very efficient. Now I'm praying to God and I'm half-hearted, you know? And he said, that's how I pray. Make me love you at least as much as I love the devil. Make me worthy to serve you, to love you as I loved my sins. And then again he said, it is good to stretch your arms up in the air to pray to God that when you separate from your body, your soul cannot be disturbed by all those who try to hinder it on its way. So he talks about the art of dying to have a sort of a vertical movement exactly as we teach in the art of dying in a yogic way. Another wild story. Not long time ago, one of the fathers took his apprentice during the Holy Lent. The Holy Lent is in Easter, so it was somewhere in March or April. And told him, son, in these holy days, because the Holy Lent is like very, you have to be very holy for them. Let us uh, have this rule. Let us go in the desert. So in the desert, it will be more inconvenient, less comfort. They are fasting anyway, either black fast or another kind of Lent and so on. And let's go into the desert. And if God will make us worthy to see any of the hermits, like there are others who are really holy. We are just a bunch, two idiots, you know. But let's go on and if, if maybe we'll meet two very holy, some holy people, then we can take a blessing from that hermit. Like total modesty, total humbleness. Going through the area of Siddha, they saw down into a deep valley a hut and trees which were having all sorts of fruits on them against the season, like in March, April, in that time, you'll not have fruits on the trees. Therefore, descending on the footpath and getting closer, we shouted, bless us, uh, fathers, you know, like, like a salutation, greetings. Hey, bless us, fathers, like telling them we are coming, you know, hear us, you know. And they answered, welcome, fathers. And at the, at the same moment when that word came, Everything disappeared, both the hut and the trees. Turning back, we climbed back on the top of the mountain from where we saw the hut, and we saw it again. And then we descended again. And again we said the same word, and we heard the same voice. And again everything disappeared. Then I told to my brother, let's go, son, from here. I believe in Christ because these servants of God told us, welcome. And I think that because of that, Christ will make us worthy to go to them in the afterlife for their prayers, for their intermediation, for their sweat, and for their works. Like, they found somebody that they couldn't touch physically. They were there, but they were not, you know, and then they had the modesty of saying, okay, but they told us, Welcome, fathers. So we are welcome to them, but maybe not right now. Huh? This is how these people were thinking. They were in a thinking which was both magic and at the same time full of this respectfulness, full of this veneration. There's a story which I alluded to. It was from here. This is about... A brother whose name is known, he was called Aretas. There was a brother from Faran with his name Aretas, who was a little bit more careless in his spiritual life. When he was about to die, they, they sat around him, many of the parents, many of the fathers, and seeing them, the old man, going with joy, out of his body like he was dying and he was joyful and wanting to have a teaching for the other brothers then he said brother believe me we all know that you have not been very industrious in your asceticism how how is it that you go from here with so much enthusiasm 
And then the brother told him, Believe me, father, you spoke the truth, but ever since I became a monk, I don't know that I ever judged any human being. But if and if I did, immediately in the same day, I went and made peace with that human being. And I would like to tell to God, you said, Master, do not judge, and you shall not be judged, and forgive, and you shall be forgiven. And all of them becoming amazed by this practice, the elder told him, Peace be upon you, son, because you have saved your soul even without too much effort. Of course, it's not that there was not effort, because there was an effort, but it was somewhere else. Another kind, they had such simple lives, such primitive lives. In the monastery of Arcelan, there was also uh, an Ava. They called them Ava by the Jewish name Abba. Even Jesus called God Ava. Ava means daddy. Yeah? So Ava or Abba is father. It's a, it's a sweet Aramaic and Jewish name, Hebrew name for father. There was also there Ava George which was nicknamed from Arcelai, George the Arcelite, who had a great fame in our desert and about which many told us about many and great miracles. And I will try to tell you a few of them briefly. When the barbarians uh, took over the road of Palestine, the oil, it usually it's sunflower oil in that part of the world, became very sparse, very rare in the holy mountain Sinai because this was coming from the bigger, it was the Silk Road or a ramification of the Silk Road and this was coming from caravans and commerce and there was no commerce because there were some of these Bedouin tribes which created a riot and the road was blocked for maybe 50 years or God knows. Then the abbot came to the monastery of Arcelan and he asked the man of God, George, to come to the holy mountain. Not being capable to disobey the abbot, he went together with him. So he was very humble. The abbot came, come, we need your help. He said, okay. And the abbot take him into an attic, into a deposit of oil, and ask him to make prayers for the barrels which were without oil at all, and the abbot said towards Ava George, jokingly, let's pray, Father, just for one barrel, because if we would pray for all of them, we would swimming in so much oil. Doing them prayer for a barrel, immediately the oil gushed in that barrel like from a spring. And then the elder said towards those who were serving there, take the oil and slowly, slowly fill up all the other barrels. And being all the barrels full, the first barrel continued to spring oil exactly as it happened at the time of the prophet Elisei, one of the Old Testament. Then the abbot wanted to give to this barrel the name of Abba George. And the old man told him, if you do this, I stop the oil immediately. You know, like, why would you call it the barrel of Ava George? No? That's why they called him the abbot of the most holy God giving birth, Mary, of Virgin Mary, the, ab the barrel of Mary. And that barrel stayed and it was preserved until today. Above it, there is still an oil lamp which is burning all the time in the honor of the most holy virgin mary so from this you see that even when they did miracles they were not assuming them they were not appropriating them they were just keeping their modesty it's funny that the abbot asked him to come and he did and why didn't the abbot go and pray the abbot knew that his prayer was not as strong as the prayer of that man and still that man was obeying to the abbot like a puppy. The abbot told him, come, he came. He said, pray, he prayed. 
But at some point when the abbot pushed the envelope and he said, we'll call it the Battle of Ava George. He said, hey, the fuck you will, you know? Like, you will not. No, it's like... Uh, he said, if you do that, I stop the oil right now. You know, it's like... Here is an exemplary story. Ava George of Gadamet, a very holy man who was among the elder fathers of the holy mountain, that when he was young, something, the following story happened. He said, they came here, a brother, to become a monk. He didn't tell to anybody, neither his country of origin, nor his name, and he got so much piety and so much silence that if there was no need, he never was speaking with no man, neither few words nor many words. Being very persistent in his practice, approximately after the, in the middle of the second year, so after a year and a half, he passed away. Like this young man died after one year and a half of nothing. Maybe he was eating too little. Maybe he was subliming too much. We don't know. And putting him into the graveyard of the other, with the other fathers, after one day, another one of the elders passed away. And then we opened the grave again because they had a collective grave. In the, gra the graveyards in the mountains are very small to bury them besides, to bury the old man. And we did not find the, the body of the brother which was buried before, he being taken to God bodily. After all these, I researched carefully, we researched carefully, because some people said that he had been the son of Emperor Mauricio, which his nanny made to escape, when the dictator Focas killed in the hypodrome all the sons of Mauritius and who in that big trouble changed the child and she gave her own son to be murdered instead of the son of the emperor. So his nanny was so devoted that she said the son of the emperor is royal blood, it's more precious than my son. So she just swapped and when they killed, they didn't kill the son of the emperor, they killed her own son. That's about devotion from a servant. Yeah? What should the devotion of a servant be? When he grew up, the nanny told him the fact, and because of this, he said, he preferred to bring himself as ransom to God for the child which was killed instead of him. So he felt guilty that a child had been assassinated instead of him. And he said, what shall I do with my life then? No? He said, I'll give it to God, just like that. That's just to see the kind of character, the kind of beauty which was there. And then there are a few more. But this one was beautiful because he disappeared bodily. This is a, one of the typical examples of the diamond body. That people who, when they die, in a few days, they just dematerialize and they disappear. You would say, maybe he got away. But it was their monastery. It was in the desert. It would be hard to presume that the guy was not actually dead and he woke up in the night and he got out of the... Where did he go then? No, he was in the desert. So it's very difficult in such circumstances to... And here is another beautiful one, another George. When he was about to go to God, like he was dying, our new Moses, the most holy John the, of the ladder, John Kalimaki is uh, one of the famous saints, a big one, and he was a, an abbot there. They came to him crying, Ava George, who was his very brother, his biological brother. So these two brothers, one of them was Abbot, one of them was, who was his own brother, and telling him, oh my God, are you leaving me here and you are going away? 
I was praying that you should assist me when I die because I am not able to govern around here anything without you, my brother and my Lord, and now I am to accompany you to death. What a humbleness, you know, he said like, you are not only very holy and very much full of grace, but like I'm not even able to do administrative work here, you know. You are the valuable one. No, and he said, now you are dying before me. And then Ava John told him, do not trouble yourself. Don't worry. Because if I will find boldness before God, I will not leave you to stay behind me, not even one year from now. No. He said, if I will find boldness, like maybe I've been a sinner and I go to hell then what can I ask God? Because my merit is equal to zero. No? But he said, if I will have some merit, then God will listen to what I ask. And then he said, you will die within one year. Like death was a reward for him. He said, don't worry, I will pray for you to die quickly. Which, says the Chronicle, also happened because in 10 days, he also went to God. So that guy got boldness before of God, and this guy died in another 10 days. End of story. And for them, it was a blessing. They considered him this a blessing. Just to see again what their values were. As a beautiful one for interaction with demonic forces, it was told to us that Ava Eusebius, the abbot of the monastery of Rait, that a demon went to the hut of an old man dressed as a monk. And knocking at the door, the old man opened and he said, pray. It was like a password, you know, pray. Well, like I want to see that you are Christian, you know, or something, pray. And the demon said, now and forever and forever, amen. <laughs> but the old man told him, no, 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 pray three times. And the demon always said, now and forever and forever and ever, amen. Then the old man told him, go in your way, like go away. He didn't receive him in. He said, go away, pray, and you would better pray like this. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, always, now, and forever, and forever and ever. Amen. This, this saying all these things, the demon, as chased away by fire, became invisible, disappeared, faded away. The, by the way, of the fact that they believe that the true prayer keeps the demons at bay. A beautiful one. How do they deal with temptation? Because people say, oh, I cannot deal with them. You know, I'm jealous. I cannot stop my jealousy. I'm an asshole. I cannot stop being an asshole. The same Ava Zenon, this is an Ava called Zenon. It's a Greek name. Zenon was a great philosopher in Greece, but it's not that one. This is a Christian mystic called Zenon also. Ava Zenon going to Palestine, so he was going from Sinai to Palestine, which is today's Israel. So he was on the borderline towards Israel. And being tired, he was sitting close to a vegetable garden of some farmer who was on the way. And he wanted to eat something. And his thought told him, take a cucumber and eat it. Because what big deal is a cucumber you know, in a farm? And then he answered to his own thought. He spoke to his own demon in his mind, to the thought. He answered to his own thought. All the thieves get punishment. Therefore, first of all, test yourself if you can take the punishment. And standing up, he, st he stood in the sunshine for five days nonstop. Like five days and five nights. He just stood there in the sunshine directly. And frying in the sunshine, he said, I cannot take this punishment. And then he told to his thought, if you cannot, then do not steal and do not eat it. No? 
Like, this is the Vira way of dealing. You know, it's like you say, I cannot, I am weak. Like, give it to yourself, see. You know, this is a, an attitude which the angels will applaud and God will smile upon who? And there is a long story here. I would like to read it because this shows so much the human soul is about Zenon. I, we met with one of the fathers who stayed for a certain time together with Abba Zenon. And when he started telling us some useful teachings, some useful words, I asked of one of my thoughts, saying like this, if somebody has some thoughts, it can mean good thoughts, bad thoughts, and sees himself vanquished by the demons. And many times he reads and hears what the old fathers say about cleansing your soul. And he wants to be clean, but he doesn't manage. Is it good to speak to one of the elders or does he have to try to do what he is reading in the books and trying to be content in his own conscience? And the old man told them. This was a disciple of Zenon. He said, you have to talk about it to another who can give you some help and not just rely on yourself because nobody can help only himself, especially when they are tortured by temptations. Because he said, this old man, me, in my youth, I also had this. I had a passion of my soul. It doesn't say what it is. They don't like to speak about their sins concretely, not to inspire others. He simply said, I had a vice. I had a vice in my soul, like, you know, you would say, I can't hate, stop hating people or whatever. He was masturbating. He was doing something which they didn't like. And I gave in to this. And hearing about Ava Zenon, that he, many people, he healed them spiritually, I thought about going and telling to him. And the devil stopped me, tricked me, by saying, since you know what you have to do to get rid of this, Vice, why don't you work according to what you read in the books? Why do you want to disturb and scandalize the old man with your shit? And when I was striving to go for a very little time, very significant, he says, when I was trying to go, striving to go, for a very little time, the war was going away from me. Like the demon was leaving him alone because he was about to go to Zenon. No, and that, uh, you know, the demon didn't like that. He knew what will come from that. No? And therefore, he was tricked all the time. They had thoughts which said, why do you want to disturb the old man? You know what you have to do, you know? And, so, and then when he tried to go even more, then he got peace. Like when you try to go to the dentist and suddenly your teeth are not hurting anymore, you know? And it's typical, you know, it's the subconscious mind. And when I was convinced, okay, I'm not going to see the old man. Again, the vice was coming to me. And yet again, I was striving to go. And exactly the same trap was given to me by the devil because he did not want me to talk to the old man. And many times I went to the old man to tell him. But the devil, the enemy, was not letting me do it, bringing shame in my heart. It was something shameful, yeah? whatever it was, bringing shame in my heart and telling me, you know how you have to heal yourself. What need do you have to tell to another person? Because you are not without any care towards yourself. You know what the fathers say in their books? These were suggested to me by the devil so that I will not show my pain to the doctor, which was Ava Zenon, and I would be healed. And the old man could see that I had a thought, but he did not scold me. Like he said, hey, you come, you came five times, I feel that you want to tell me something. He didn't say anything. He just stayed. The old man, he didn't scold me, waiting until I myself was ready to tell him what I want. And he taught me about the righteous life. He gave him general teachings. 
and set me free. Later, being me, being I sad and crying like he was continuing with this shit, I told to my own soul, until when, you bastard of a soul, will you not want to get healed? All people from far away come to this old man and they are healed spiritually and you are not ashamed to have such a doctor of the soul close to you and still you stay around sick. And setting on fire like a fire, he said, in my heart, I stood up and I told in my heart, if I go to the old man again, I, and I will not find anybody at home, like the old man won't be there, then he still was trying tricks, you know, like I go, but maybe he will not be at home. Maybe the dentist is not working at this hour, no? Then I will know that this is the will of God to uh, not to tell him my thought. Oh, he meant if I don't find somebody else there, like a guest, if he is alone without guests. So I went and there were no guests. But the old man was teaching, as usually, about the salvation of the soul and how somebody can clean their dirty thoughts. And because, again, I became ashamed, the function of shame, yeah? and I did not tell him what I wanted to taste, I asked him to set me free again. And standing up, the old man prayed, said a prayer, and he went along with me, going ahead of me, in front of me, until the front door. And I, tortured by the thoughts to tell or not to tell to the old man, I followed him hesitatingly, but the old man paid no attention to me. He just held the door open so that I should pass. But when he saw how tortured I looked, he suddenly turned towards me and he gave me a big hug. And he said, what's the matter with you? I'm a human being also. When the old man told me this thought, I thought that my heart burst open. And I fell with my face at his feet, praying to him with tears and tell him, have mercy on me. And he told me, what's the matter? And I told him, you know what my problem is. He still is trying, you know. He, he said, he's still ashamed, you know. And he told me, you have the need to tell me what the matter is. And after I, full of shame, I told him about my vice, he told me, why did you be, uh, become ashamed to tell me, am I also not a human being? Would you like me to tell you my stuff? No? Isn't it three years since you come here with such thoughts and you don't have the power to speak? And I, falling at his feet and praying him, I says, have mercy on me for the name of God. And he told me, go, do not neglect your prayer, like stay with your prayer, and do not condemn anybody in your soul. Therefore, I went into my hut and not neglecting my prayer with the gift from God and with the power of the prayer of the old man, I was no longer upset by that vice. The story is a bit longer, there is more to it, but I think that is beautiful enough how people are tricked by the inner demons to stay locked in their own things. Another little story. We still have a little time. I hope you start feeling the energy specific to these people. You get in touch with uh, these amazing people. The same old man told me this. 22 years ago, I went with my apprentice John in Porphyritis. Porphyritis is just a village somewhere in Sinai. There is a similar city in Greece, but that's not what is taught about. And wanting to sit there, to sit there and practice, and we found two hermits, 
and we stood close to them. One of them, called Theodore, was from Melitini, from the monastery of Ava Theoctis, and the other one, called Paul, Pavel, Paul, in English, was from the monastery of St. Eftimius. They were wearing cloth made of ox skin. They were dressed in like skin, in leather jackets. They had some leather thing, which in the desert, it should be probably very hot and very uncomfortable. But they had no clothes. They were dressed in some buffalo hide. I st we stayed there approximately two years. And we were far from each other as about, it gives an ancient measure, which I don't know how big it is. Okay, maybe hundreds of meters, maybe more. One day, when my apprentice was sitting down, he got bitten by a snake. And immediately, he died, and blood came out of all his parts of the body, through all the holes of the body. I got very sad, and I went to those hermits. And as soon as they saw me, troubled and sad, before I coming to say something, they said, What's happened? Ava Zosima. The brother, the young brother died? Yes, I told them. Then they came after me, and as they saw him fallen to the ground, they told me, Don't be sad, Ava Zosima. God can help. And shouting at my brother, at my brother, they said, Brother John, stand up. The old man needs you. And indeed, the brother stood up from the ground. And looking for the snake and catching it, they broke it in two in front of us. They broke the snake in two. So they could raise dead, but they didn't have a problem of killing a venomous snake by the way of nonviolence. You know, where is the borderline of nonviolence? And then they told to me, Avadosima, go to Sinai because God wants to give you the church of Babylon. Indeed, I left and going to Sinai, after a few days, the Ava of Sinai sent me and other two in Alexandria. In, and giving the Ava of Alexandria, the Bishop of Alexandria, the most happy Apollinari, made all three of us bishops, one for Heliopolis, another one for Lentopolis, and me for Babylon. So these guys telepathically, clairvoyantly, they said, go to Babylon. They will make you bishop. A few more inspiring stories, either showing the power of prayer of these people. I will not... I will tell you the story of Isikia the Choreva from Choreva. He had always spent his time in a total carelessness, having no worry of his soul, no care for his soul, like not praying, not doing too much spiritual work. But one day, being very sick with his body, it's, it seems that one hour and he will die. And again, coming back from this disease, he had been in a sort of a coma, a trance. Then he asked all of us to go away immediately. And then, walling up the door of his hut, he remained closed in that hut for 12 years without talking absolutely with nobody. He was talking only, he was eating only bread and water because they were giving it to him probably. He was sitting and looking at the things which he saw when he came out of himself in the ecstasy of that disease. He was so focused with the mind in himself that he never changed this way of life, always having a short breath and always shedding hot tears of repentance. <laughs> short breath, that's a short breath. For 12 years, yeah? Speak about Bhavana and Shakti Chalana and all that, yeah? So when he was about to pass away, we broke down the door and we went inside. And after we asked him a lot to tell us something from your experience, so we learned only this we heard from him. Please forgive me. Nobody who knows what is the remembrance of death will be able to do any sin ever again. And we were amazed seeing the man who was so 
indifferent, transform totally through a most happy transformation. And putting him with piety in the graveyard which was near the Roman fortress, after a few days looking for his holy body, we didn't find it anymore. God giving us a signal in this way as well about his most thoughtful repentance and praiseworthy for all those who want to straighten themselves after a long carelessness in their life. There was another abbot here, Isaur, a man carrying the Holy Spirit and having the charisma of healing, the gift of God of healing. A paralyzed man was in the infirmary. Some, some monasteries had an infirmary, a hospital. And being visited by our mistress, the God giving birth, Mary, she told him, like in a vision, Go to the abbot to pray for you and you will become healthy. So the paralyzed man was carried to the abbot and through the will of God, as he knocked at the door, nobody came out except the abbot himself. So he was able to get directly to the abbot. And therefore, as he came out, the paralyzed person fell at his feet, grabbed his feet and he said, I will not let you go because the mother of God sent me to you to heal me. Being very forced by him, it says very forced. Silit is a word in Romanian which means like raped almost, you know. Being like really forced by him, the old man then untied his belt and gave it to him and said, take it and put it on yourself. And as he took the belt on, he was healed immediately and he went away full of joy and giving praise to God. Just somebody who was... A very beautiful one which I said at some point about morality and ethics. It's a wonderful story. Relationship between a man and morality and a man and animals. Ava John, John of Rome, the apprentice of the wonderful John of Sava, said like this, as we were sitting in the Arsalan monastery, there one day there appears a great hedgehog and brought her little cub. So there was a female hedgehog, a full animal, who brought the cub, which was, and she was carrying it in her mouth because it was blind. The little hedgehog, the cub, it was blind. It was born with a defect and put it down at the feet of the man, of the old man. When he saw the holy man, this John of Sava, that he, the animal was blind, he bowed over to the ground. He made some dust. He mixed some dust with saliva like Jesus did. And he smeared the eyes of the little animal. And immediately the animal opened the eyes and saw. And the mother of the hedgehog almost was like kissing the footsteps of the old man and then taking the baby which she had brought, she went away like hopping with joy. Look, the second day, the mother of the little hedgehog brings to the old man in her mouth a big cabbage, pulling it with great difficulty and smiling. And then the old man told her, where did you bring a cabbage? Like we are in the desert, right? For sure you must have stolen it from the gardens of other hermits who live here. But I will never eat a thing which is stolen. Please take it and take it back from where you stole it. And becoming ashamed, the animal took the cabbage and took it back to the garden from where it had stolen it. Like even an animal knows morality and ethics when helped by the consciousness of a human being. That's why we human beings, we have to behave like the intermediaries between God and the animals. For the animals, we are a visible aspect of God. Only that we don't behave like God. We have become perverted and immoral and cruel and a lot of other things. 
the same John of Sava, it's a bit of a longer story, but it's amazing what he says. Pay attention to how sensitive this guy was. He says, once I was sitting in the remote wilderness and they came to me a brother from a monastery to visit me. And I asked him, hey, how are the other fathers in the monastery? And he said, because of your prayers, they are okay. Then I asked him of a certain other, or specifically of a certain brother, who had a bad name and a bad fame. And here t he tells me, believe me, Father, that one, he still has the same reputation. Hearing this, so he, uh, he knew about somebody who was a sinner, whatever. Hearing this, I said, <laughs> he said, he just sighed. But it's a sigh which says, shit, you know, it, it's a condemning sigh. As soon as I said, I fell in a sleep, like in an ecstasy, and I've seen myself standing before the place of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and I saw Jesus crucified between the two thieves. I pushed myself forward to bow down and to get close to him, and when Christ saw this, he ordered with a very big voice, like with a commanding voice, to the angels which were present, saying, throw him out, because for me this is Antichrist, because even before I pass judgment, he judged his own brother. And when I was carried by the angels, chased away, I came out through the gate, and my cover, it's a sort of a mantle, which he had on his shoulders, he got caught, and as the gate got closed, it ripped back, and I left it there. And in, immediately, I woke up. I therefore tell to the brother who was visiting me, this was a real bad day for me. And he says, why, father? And then I told him my vision, and I says, believe me, my cape is the, cover, the covering from God, is the cape of God which was upon me, and which now I have no more, like a grace, like he had a sort of aura from God. And from that day, my sons, I tell you, as to the Lord above, that I spent seven years in the desert more, not tasting from the sleep, seven years not tasting from the sleep, nor going under any human roof, nor encountering any human being until again I saw the Lord who gave order that I should be given my mantle back. And all we, hearing such a story from the Holy John, we said, if such a just one and barely can be saved, what will happen with the unholy and the sinner? Therefore, from here it is clear that the calumny is a great sin. That's the moral of the story. This guy just said, ah, that guy, I was like, Walter. How is Walter? Ah, he's still bad. And then he lost the grace just because he puffed like a horse. Another wonderful story is this one. It's saying it's Ava Joseph from Rait again. But all are in different years. They are not happening in the same. It's over a few centuries, two, three centuries. So they are different holy people living at different times. That this elder Joseph of Rait came somebody to ask about a thought. Like everybody has a thought, you know, like people want to ask a question. Of course, they will ask, how should I be saved? I have a problem. I have a... They call it generically. They say the person had a thought and he came to ask about that thought. He knocked at the door and not receiving any answer, he looked through the crack of the door and he saw the full body of the old man, head to toes, standing like a flame, 
standing like in a flame, like surrounded by a light like a flame. Terrified, he paralyzed in his body and he stood dumbfolded on the earth like dead for almost one hour. Like just by seeing this, you know, and the old man was praying, he got so afraid and you know, he, he was paralyzed for one hour. And then standing up again, he stood near the door. Taken into his contemplation, the old man never knew what happened. And after five full hours, he again became like a human being. He opened the door and he took the brother in as a guest. And sitting down, he says, when, when did you come? How long ago did you come? Answering, he told to the old man, I came here since approximately four hours, but because I didn't want to disturb you, I knocked at the door only now. Then the old man immediately saw that this man knew what had happened, what was happening inside, and he never said anything about it to that brother. He answered to all the questions that he was asked about. He healed him from his thought, like the thought is like a bug in your brain, and he was healed by his thought, and he let him go. He set him free, after which he disappeared, being afraid of the praise of other human beings. Because he knew that this guy will go and tell the story. And then in a month, they will start streaming in. No? Then he just vanished. He ran away. But see how discreet. He didn't speak about it. He didn't, you know, like everything is like some things. Normal people, you know, they can't know. They can't see some things. One more about the diamond body. Ava Martirius, who was uh, the one who anointed our abbot, he stayed for a few years in the Gulf of Ava Antony, beyond the Red Sea. So somewhere in the area of Sinai, in, there is a gulf which was called then the Gulf of Ava Antony. And as he was sitting there, there was an invasion of some barbarian, of some cruel barbarians, against those who were living in those mountains, where they were all hermits. And they killed those barbarians, they killed six of the fathers, among which there was all one called Ava Conon of Cilicia, a man who had the gift of clairvoyance and of prophecy. Therefore, taking their bodies, Ava Martirio buried them in a cave, putting on the mouth of the cave, on the entrance of a cave, a big stone and smearing it with this white thing from which you make a paste, it's, a, it's a calcium hydroxide uh, in chemistry. It's a reacting substance, white, which you put it in the water, it boils and it takes gas out of it. And then with that water, then you can paint the walls in white. It's one of the nature substances, which is very reactive chemically. And he smeared with this on the joints and he wrote on that, uh, white thing, their names in case he wouldn't return or if somebody will find them. After a time, he went to search the uh, grave to see if the grave had been opened by a hyena or some other wild animal. Coming here, he found the inscription on that white substance untouched and all the ceiling of the grave was untouched. Opening the grave and going inside, he found two bodies moved to God only where only God knows. These bodies were one of Ava Conon and one of another great elder. So he buried six people. He found only four. Two of them disappeared with their body in a situation which is difficult to fake. You know, in this way, like, oh, maybe there is another explanation, maybe, but there is a very little probability about this. Ava Mato. Okay, I'll continue for a few minutes until I say, I want to charge you up with as many stories as possible so you see the environment in which these people were living. And Ava Mato, another fellow from there, he says, Satan doesn't really know with what vice 
he can destroy your soul. That is why he is seeding all kind of thoughts of fornication, of gossip, and all sorts of other vices, but he doesn't know if he will crop the crop, if it will give any fruit. He just puts the seeds, and to whatever vice he sees that the soul inclines, that's the, that's the one which he gives to the human being. No? So it's like, even for the demons, there is... They try, they try everything just to see if you fall for it. An amazing story. In the monastery of Arcelan, there was also the Ava Michael of Georgia, a Georgian from Russian Georgia, from Georgia near the Caspian Sea. Michael of Georgia, who went to the Lord five years ago. So the story is always told after they die to not create this uh, praise, you know, to not inflate their ego. He, has all, he also had an apprentice, which we, which was, who is called Eustatius, and who told us this story. Getting sick, Ava, Michael, Ava Eustatius, his disciple, came to him crying. The graveyard of the monks who was there in the area, it was in a very, very difficult place because Sinai is very much rock and stone. They don't have flat fields in some areas. So it was, the graveyard itself was placed in some really place, dangerous to get there because it is somewhere on a slope which had very slippery stones on it. And then Ava Michael said to his disciple Eustatius, son, bring me water to wash and to get communion and after he did this he did the final rites whatever he told to him my son it is really dangerous and slippery to go down to the graveyard and when i will be dead you will endanger your life if you will try to take me to the graveyard i am afraid that you might fall and die as well that is why i have a suggestion Let's go now, slowly, slowly, together. And going, descending together, the old man prayed and giving a hug to Eustatius, told him, peace be upon you, my son, and pray for me. And lying down in his grave, he went to the Lord with all the joy and with all the enthusiasm which he had. Ava Nil, he says, as many things as you will do to take revenge on a brother who did injustice to you, all of them will be done back to you in your heart during your prayer. So, if you act bad outside, then you can expect hell inside. <clears throat> and he said something, this is valid for you yogis, as much as my, many of you are yoga teachers, and you live in the world. He says the monk who loves peace and solitude will not be wounded too much by the arrows of the demons. But the ones who mingle together with the crowds, they will have often wounds. So he basically says you choose to live in the society, expect lots of tests and lots of wounds. We are getting close to the end. Let's see if I manage. It's about Orentia, Ava Orentia. He says, even after he got his hands burned, he, God made many signs through him. Once they came to the holy mountain Sinai, a patrician woman, a rich Roman woman, who had her own daughter suffering and who, hearing about the old man, came to prostrate to him. But the old man did not allow her to do any prostration, and he just took a grape, a grape bunch, a bunch of grapes, uh, the fruit called grape, but the whole bunch, not uh, one single grape, the whole grape bunch, and sent it to her, as to the daughter who was sick. As soon 
as this was seen, the demon inside the girl started screaming, Why did you come here, Ava Orentia? And throwing the daughter to the ground, went out of her. So this guy could send his presence through a grape. Send her a grape. And the girl was not there. And when he saw the demon, recognized it immediately. The demons know. No, and he said, why did you come here, Ava Orenti? Exactly as happened with Jesus when he healed, the, he sent those demons inside the pigs, if you remember that episode. About Sergei, Serge. Some of the fathers of Sinai told us about Ava Serge, the hermit, saying that when he was in Sinai, the abbot of the monastery, put him to take care of the mules. Everybody was doing some karma yoga. So this guy, a great hermit, was in charge of the mules. So when he was coming back one of the days, there was a lion in the middle of the road, in the middle of the path. As soon as they saw him, the other mule leaders and the ones helping them, they ran away full of fear. And then Ava, Serge, taking from his bag, a blessed piece of bread, this bread which is given for communion, he went straight to the lion and he said, take some holy bread from the fathers and get away from the road so we can pass. And the lion, taking the bread, went away. A very beautiful one about fasting to see an attitude. One Silwan, it's Ava Silwan, this, gone, this guy did a lot of great things. Ava Silwan and his apprentice Zakaria came to a monastery. And those from the monastery made them taste a little bit of food before going back on their road. They say, guy, before you go, take something. And going out of the monastery, his apprentice, on the way, he found a spring somewhere, some water. And he wanted to drink at which the elder men tell him, Zachariah, today is a fasting day. It's a land day. When these guys, when they are fasting, they are not drinking even water. Yeah? And he said, uh, Zachariah, you forgot, it's a fasting day. But the, the disciple said, but didn't we just eat in the monastery, Father? You know, it's a fasting day, but they just gave us food in the morning and probably to drink. And the old man said, what we ate was because of the love which they have for us and we have for them. But we, otherwise, we are going to hold our fast, my son. You know? Like, incredible that they are, you know, like they would bend the tapas for love, but actually they will not give up at all. You know, they didn't want to offend the people from the monastery and they ate a little bit, but the old man knew it's a fasting day. We eat because of... These people give us love and we give them back love, you know, and that's higher than our fasting. No, but otherwise, we are fasting. Other stories. The same Silwan, sitting with the brothers, was in, entered in ecstasy. And he came with his face to the ground. And after a long time being in this state, he stood up and he was crying. And they asked, the brothers asked him, what's happened, father? What's up? And he was silent and crying. And forcing him to talk to them, he said, I was enraptured in uh, the judgment you know, in the divine judgment, and I have seen many in our family of monks going towards punishment, and I have seen also many people who are not monks and who are going to the kingdom of God. And the man was crying, the old man was crying, and he didn't want to come out of his hut. And if he was forced to come out for whatever tasks, he covered his face with his bonnet, and people, and, and he was telling them, why do I want to this, this transient light, which is of total uselessness? No? He said, you think you see light. This is not light. You should see the light. And more about, let's finish with this. Silwan, who was staying in ecstasy. His apprentice Zakaria 
entered and found him in ecstasy with the hands up to heaven, like in Tadasana or something, and closing the door, he went out. He left him. Coming again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, these are hours from sunrise, so sixth hour is 12 o'clock, ninth hour is 3 p.m. He found him in the same. Approximately the tenth hour, so it was like 4 p.m., he knocked at the door and finding he found him being quiet, but not in ecstasy, and telling him, what's up today, father? And he said, oh, I've been sick today, my son. But he grabbed his feet, he went down to his feet, and he said, I will not let go of your feet if you don't tell me what you saw. You know? At which the old man told him, I have been in rapture to heaven, and I have seen the glory of God, and that's where I stayed until now, and now I am back. Once, Avasiluan being in Mount Sinai, his apprentice Zachariah went to do some other job, and he told to the old man, please let the water flow and put some water in the garden. They had probably an irrigation system. And he, going, he covered his face with his bonnet, and he just looked at the feet where he was going. In an, at the same time, another brother came there and saw him from far away. He understood, and then he came and visited him, and he said, Tell me, Ava, why did you cover your face with a bonnet, and you watered the garden like this? And the old man said, My son, so that my eyes will not see the trees and have the mind busy with them during the prayer because of this. So this man thought, if he sees trees, it will diminish his prayer. Well, I have more. Maybe I'll tell them to you another time. I just gave you... I, I still have about 10 stories, maybe 12 stories like this. You got the point. I'm seeing that it's more than 10.30, and I want to let you go at the reasonable hours of this satsang. Otherwise, we'd stay later. It's enough as energy. You feel the energy. You feel the madness. You feel the aspiration. You feel the absolutely uncompromising nature of the lives of these people. It is of little importance if you are Christian or not. Because if you go to a Zen monastery in Japan, or if you go to a Sufi Darga in Turkey, and you apply the same spirit, you will get what they get. It's not the religion which matters, it's the spirit that you saw. There are many people. This last one, Silwan, you know, he said, I've seen many monks going to hell. No, because they were in monasteries. They were surrounded. But don't think that all of them were doing a good job. Many of them, as happens today, as it happens in Buddhism, as it happens in Indian ashrams, as it happens in so many places, many of them were making a poor job out of it. Not everybody who does yoga becomes a great yogi. No? And at the same time, no, we are all human beings, as that old man said. No? It's very important to purify our souls, to try to cultivate the moral and ethical values, to practice purity, to practice prayer, to have all the help which we can. The advantage in yoga is that you get mantras, you get yantras, you're going to say, eh, it doesn't matter so much. It's not true. Yoga has this enormous benefit that, you know, maybe these people were having sexual phantasms. But what if you do a hundred with the And if you want to be ascetic, if you want to be do sexual tantra, do sexual tantra, it's fine. You have another alternative, which these people were not even dreaming about. But let's say, like them, you want to have a period of time in your life where you are ascetic, you know. If you have too much of that, eh, these people say pray. Talk to your confessor and tell him, Father, I am persecuted by demons, I'm so horny. And so what to do, you know. But in yoga you also have Udhyana and Nauli and shoulder stand and head stand and other things which work. You know? So of course, each spiritual line has its own ups and downs. In yoga, many people become very technical and sometimes they forget the spirit, the Ishvara Pranidhana, the aspiration, this madness, because they rely too much on technology. On the other hand, when we see such people, 
we see that having so little means at their disposal, so little technology, nevertheless, for some of them, their soul was so strong that they were succeeding. They were succeeding almost without having clear methods. And that's why I always am enchanted. Uh, I knew that you will not find many of the stories from the, it's called the Patericon of Sinai, no, and um, you will not find it. I have it, but it's difficult to translate. I will not uh, go into such a, if some Christian organization doesn't translate it already. And uh, therefore, um, I hope that it brought to you some inspiration. Again, it, it's not only about Christianity. It's about your aspiration, your sincerity, your integrity how you are with your own goals. You saw that even in with such poor methods, some of these people were getting the diamond body, for God's sake. There were several of them which are told that they died, and then they could not find the bodies. The bodies dis I read at least about four of them, that the body disappeared, even 24 hours later, boom. That's the diamond body. And in Indian and Tibetan yoga, it's considered to be a major city, a major accomplishment. You know, even Ramakrishna's body did not disappear. You know, even Shivananda's body did not disappear. Even great, great yogis that we know about, they didn't get their diamond body as far as we know. Maybe it happened later. Maybe Shivananda, after 30 days, he disappeared, but then we don't know. We, anything can be possible. But what I'm trying to say is... This, that these people are exemplary through the power of their soul and through their commitment. And I hope you have seen some of these values of Anahata Chakra. Extraordinary humbleness, extraordinary modesty, extraordinary love, extraordinary forgiveness. They're like everything subordinated to their heart, doing everything through their heart. That man was not allowing his disciple to drink some water. And he says, Zakaria, it's fasting day. You know, water, not to drink water in the desert, in Sinai, which is a tropical climate, you know. And they were walking out in the outdoors, you know. Imagine how parched of thirst you get in a day of fasting with water, black fasting, and so on. You know? And in the morning, they had eaten in the monastery. But he said, hey, forget, that was an act of love. That was something else. But the tapas is the tapas. The act of love was stronger than their tapas. No? But nevertheless, they never forgot about their commitment and what they were doing. So I hope this has brought something beautiful in your heart. I have more if ever, not, not next week for sure. I don't want to do it two weeks in a row. Uh, but at some any point, I feel like telling you some wild stories about great mystics. I'll maybe come there another 12 stories in that book that I would like to share with you. Thank you all for joining tonight. I hope this was of inspiration for your souls and see you further in the activities here in Agama.